Welcome everybody to my web programming one course and this is the first uh, introduction lecture for the general video series on YouTube. The students at Reykjavik University have their uh, specific introduction lecture which covers a bit more organizational things um, but this slide set is just to recap and introduce what this course is really about. Uh, so it mainly covers organization and course overview but then we do a bit of web history as an introductory topic and uh, the technology that we will be particularly using in this course. Generally, uh, on this YouTube level, it's me as an instructor. My name is uh, Grisha Liebel. I'm an uh, assistant professor at Reykjavik University. I'm originally from, German. I, uh, from Germany. I've been living in Sweden for about eight years and did my PhD there on the topic of software engineering. Um, and now, as I said, I'm an assistant professor at Reykjavik University. In general, my research is actually on the area of software engineering. I'm not a web development person. Um, this is, of course, on the one hand, a disadvantage because maybe some things I simply don't know as much about as others. On the other hand, I see it also as an advantage for this course because I have a bit of an external view uh, and I might have some better understanding than, than experts in this area of what, what topics might be difficult to understand. Um, so take it as you will. There are other courses, of course, that are given by uh, complete experts on the area. The course is organized uh, as follows. We essentially have a bunch of different modules that go from foundation where we really are now and a bit of networking and in particular the HTTP protocol uh, to front end topics where we cover the big three languages of front end development. HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, we then have a series on, of topics on backend, and that's RESTful APIs and server-side JavaScript as a more practical part of the lecture. Uh, then we also cover at least a bit testing and debugging of applications. So how do you test or debug client-side applications? How do you test or debug server-side applications? And finally, we discover or discuss web security a bit. Uh, these lecture numbers that are used in the videos are originally from the lecture plan in the uh, 2019 edition of this course. Uh, and there we had a number of buffer lectures. So if you see in the playlist that certain numbers are missing, it doesn't mean that they are coming. Uh, it's simply the lectures that were left empty to allow for buffer topics or more uh, discussion in depth. The learning outcomes are, are uh, distributed into knowledge and comprehension, into application and analysis, and into synthesis and evaluation. This mainly applies to the uh, actual course at the university because it includes, for example, certain practical parts where you have to program for uh, the YouTube part. I would expect that you don't learn as much about actual application practical stuff as long as you don't uh, really heavily follow the course and do a lot of practical exercises yourself. Um, but to quickly go through them, uh, we will look at what the difference is between client and server side web applications. Uh, we look at HTTP requests and responses at their methods. So how does HTTP work uh, and what is the feature or the, the properties of different methods. Uh, we then go into the key language concepts of the three big languages, HTML, CSS and JavaScript. Uh, dive shortly into accessibility. So how do we make websites accessible to uh, a variety of people, for example, with different hardware, with different personality, with different uh, maybe skills for uh, or with disabilities like being blind or having a color uh, and an inability to see, for example, red and green, the differences. Then, uh, of course, given putting all of that together, it means you should be able to predict how websites look like when looking at the code and how they behave. Um, a specific part of that is asynchronous Java code, uh, so JavaScript code, an important part of uh, the web functionality. So that will be part of it. Uh, as discussed, we look at testing a bit. So what kind of testing techniques are there? There are definitely more comprehensive courses on this topic. It's really just an introduction here. Um, and then we dive into REST, so discuss what the REST constraints are, uh, discuss in particular how HTTP response status code should look like for, for this case, and finally our 
listing and explaining web security threats and we are following the OWASP top 10 list here. Uh, application analysis is very much uh, reflected uh, in the uh, learning outcomes here. So essentially looking at the previous slide, you have to be able to somehow uh, do all of these things practically. So this course is generally a quite practical course. There's a lot of programming. Uh, as I said in the in the welcome video in the YouTube series, of course, the practice sessions are not recorded because they're really live streams from uh, the classroom. And then finally, uh, on the more transfer level, you should be able to propose improvements, improve existing code, uh, access code for errors and security vulnerabilities, compare testing techniques and so on. Uh, and then as a last but definitely not least important topic, we need to discuss a bit how web applications are slowly but, uh, well, actually rapidly in the in the recent years developing into a societal problem and what the ethical impact uh, is on our profession really and on the society. The literature, uh, there is a course book used in this book, which is semi purival learning web app development. Uh, it's really just a complement to the slides. Uh, in originally, the course is not intended to have a course book because a lot of resources simply outdate quickly and there's lots of information on the web. So uh, I don't think a book is necessary. Nevertheless, if you like to read something from start to end and have sort of a complete reference, then this is the book I would recommend. Uh, there is not a perfect overlap. In particular, uh, we are just doing plain vanilla JavaScript, whereas the book uses the jQuery framework. So the JavaScript part is actually different there. Uh, then on each slide for each lecture, there are uh, literature references and usually it's things like tutorials or smaller articles. So you don't necessarily need to read the book. Uh, and then it's important to mention that I'm in particular uh, borrowing heavily from the web and database technology course at TU Delft by Claudia Hauf and Alessandro Borson. So that's really a good place uh, to look at. If you look at their website on GitHub, they have lots and lots of additional resources. Uh, my impression is that this course goes much more into depth and is potentially much more difficult. Uh, as discussed, this course is really on a pretty broad level going quickly through the basic stuff. Uh, and this is also regarding the course book. I've gotten the feedback previously that uh, in the assignments, which of course you will probably not see, but um, generally there's lots of Googling involved how to do things. Um, and that's actually maybe the key part of learning web development that uh, lots of things are on Google and in web development, they are simply changing quickly. So it is probably the most important skill if you want to stay in this area to be able to find the right information on web development. So this is also uh, why, it why it takes such a big part in this course. Basically learning to find the right tutorials, go through the official uh, documentation and things like that. Okay, that's essentially the organizational part. So let's look a bit at uh, where the web comes from. Why do we do web programming and where are we? And again, there are probably much better resources for that, but uh, this is just a quick run through the history. So the World Wide Web in itself was invented by Tim Berners-Lee um, in 89, but it was then public in, in 91. The first website in history is, is actually still accessible, so you can click this link in the, in the slide set to see it. Um, and it's just hypertext, and that's the original idea of having text, of having information, um, and the hyper essentially means we are extending this with additional elements. Uh, and the most important one is probably the hyperlink. So uh, we have text and we can reference other hypertexts. Uh, of course, over time, this has evolved into what we call hypermedia. So we have uh, not only text, we also have, for example, pictures, uh, we have animations, we have different elements that are beyond text. So that's what we generally talk about. Um, and this is formatted in the hypertext markup language, which is the uh, long form of HTML. So that's what we write websites in. Uh, and these websites are then viewed in a browser. So the browser is able to read HTML code and display something 
uh, that looks more human readable to us. Uh, that's the idea. Of course, you know how it looks like today. There's this original idea of having an information space and you have some documents that show you different things has evolved quite substantially. So uh, the web is pretty much driving lots of applications, lots of functionality that we use as a society uh, on an everyday level. I've linked here a couple of, of websites that say in the old days, I would say in the early days of the, the internet, which goes from, for example, the, the original Netscape website uh, that essentially just shows information to the Lego website, for example, which played heavily around with animations, GIFs uh, showing animated content. And uh, from a design perspective today, they are probably quite uh, ugly to look at, but that's how it evolved. And one important thing, just fast forward, that I decided to discuss, because it's, I think, important to know for today's status of the internet, is that, uh, as discussed, if we have hypermedia, hypertext, we look at this in a browser, and uh, there are a lot of these browsers. Nowadays, we're using tools like Firefox or Chrome or Edge. Um, but at some point in time, we had essentially two of them, and that was the Microsoft Internet Explorer and the Netscape Navigator, uh, and more or less a war or you could say a conflict erupted around them that they tried to essentially win the market. Um, and that was done by using different distribution means that, for example, Internet Explorer was automatically installed whenever you would install Microsoft Windows. Uh, it was done by trying to have different costs. One was for free, the other one was maybe not, um, or by bundling it, as discussed, for instance, with uh, Microsoft Windows or with any kind of uh, CDs that would allow you to access the internet. Uh, and the problem this resulted in is that uh, the, the standards de didn't develop quick enough. So you had websites that were essentially designed for one browser only because they used certain elements of the HTML language or certain features that were only present in one browser. And this rapidly evolved that you essentially had two sets uh, of valid tags of valid features and designers, developers had to make the decision, how are we optimizing our website? Are we saying you should only watch this, you should only visit this website in Internet Explorer uh, and then design it accordingly. Um, this has stopped to some extent, so the standardization has gotten much better that things look at least very similar in most browsers, but we are still seeing this to some extent that websites are developed that only work in uh, one browser. For example, the one I'm listing here requires a browser that has WebKit, which is one of the technologies, and it happens to simply not work on Firefox. Um, ironically, it's a website about web design. Uh, and this is, of course, a bit bad practice. So if you go into development of websites, think about compatibility uh, we'll later talk about accessibility. How do you make sure that your website is actually reaching a broad audience instead of restricting it? Uh, so if we learn anything from these browser wars is maybe to not try to use the most fancy feature uh, that we can think of, but it only works in a single browser. Now, why, I, why should we have a course on web development anyway uh, at the university? What's so special? And I think there are a number of, of topics that we need to discuss here. One is that technology changes rapidly. So web applications are always constantly developing. There's lots of interesting stuff to learn there, much quicker than, for example, embedded software that just simply depends on the hardware. Uh, it is accessible to everyone every day. Uh, and that means you have people using your applications that have no training that have no knowledge or very little knowledge in, in IT, in the internet, in computers. Um, the interface is playing a very large role. So if you can make a website that is well designed, that is very usable, that works well on different devices and different browsers, uh, then you actually have a large competitive advantage. So that's also an interesting aspect that maybe is not quite the same for other kinds of applications. Um, you, of course, have the potential to directly access a very large user base. Uh, and if you think about how new companies like Facebook or Google are, uh, you see that a large, to a large extent, their success actually depends on this uh, topic here. They quickly got a lot of users. And finally, 
uh, web applications are very interesting, especially because of the societal responsibility that nowadays comes with it. So we are discussing a lot of the topics, for example, around social networks, uh, around collecting data uh, about people. So this is getting much more important. Uh, and this is really where the web has come a long way in a good and in a bad sense since the, the early days when it was all about sharing a bit of information. Uh, and then finally, it's of course the World Wide Web. It's not only an application that runs uh, in your neighbor's computer, but it's really truly worldwide. Um, and finally, from a student perspective, web programming is very often the entry point to programming. So people try or start writing their own websites because uh, it, it looks nice, it gives quick results before they maybe go into actual programming. So that's why we cover part of that. Now, uh, the web is evolving quickly and it's getting quite complicated. Um, I, here I have a, a tweet, a recent one that discusses how modern web development looks like. And essentially it's, uh, it's if you read this statement, it's a bunch of buzzwords of different technologies of course, these are all made up apart from Chrome. Uh, but the problem we're slowly seeing in web development is really that the, the technology stack, the amount of different tools we're using is exploding. Um, and this requires you to be really up to date uh, to work in web development. And it requires you also to have a pretty broad knowledge to adapt to these things. So it's quite an exciting area in a way. But if you look at this statement, it's also quite scary and sometimes maybe ridiculous how this is evolving. Um, what's interesting in the web is that there are a number of languages that are really core. So the, the three we are teaching in this course, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are definitely core technologies. Um, you can argue a bit about JavaScript, but at least in the browser, it's, it's one of the key things that we have today. Um, and then there is a lot of surrounding stuff. So if we go to the previous slide, that's all these weird words that you see here that would essentially be uh, the surrounding technology. Um, for example, different frameworks, basically different environments that make it easier to write applications. And you might have heard of things like React or Node.js, uh, topics like containerization, where you might have heard things like Kubernetes, Docker, uh, things to deploy applications or related services, uh, Amazon, AWS, Microsoft, Azure, and there are a lot more uh, different solutions to store information like databases, MySQL, MongoDB, Firebase, uh, the list goes on. And then all the tools that somehow surround the development, the testing, and actually the compilation or translation of your code. Uh, and for example, there might be things like VS Code, ESLint, Babel, or Webpack. Um, and usually if you're a professional developer, you use a combination of all of these things. So it's really a bunch of different things that you need to be familiar with. Um, and one of the reasons why I have this slide is to, to say, uh, this course is supposed to be an entry point, give a broad overview. And that's why we are mainly located up here. So we really do the core. And the idea is if you have a core knowledge, a good knowledge of these topics, then it's much, much quicker to adapt to changing technologies. Because what you see is that up here, the things change not as quick. These technologies have stayed quite similar over the last years, whereas down here, it's, uh, it's almost madness. Things change very, very quickly. Uh, so the idea is if you learn this well enough, you might have a better time here. There are some things where this might not help. So if you go, for example, into containerization, there is maybe more knowledge needed about distributed systems, networks, uh, operating systems. So it's a different kind of knowledge here. Similar, if you want to be really good on persistence, then you definitely need some knowledge in databases, which we don't teach here. So uh, this is not everything you'll need, but it's a very good start. Now, uh, that being said, what are we concretely using? And with that, I'll, I'll wrap up this introduction lecture. Uh, we use plain HTML, CSS, JavaScript. So we give you a quick introduction. There's no front end framework. We don't do React. Uh, here at Reykjavik University, there's a second course on that. Um, but if you look at this course through YouTube, there are also a lot of good books that actually go into these front ends, but they all usually assume that you have some knowledge here. So this course is a good start maybe to go into depth afterwards. 
On the backend side, so essentially the software that don't, doesn't run in the browser, but it runs somewhere on the server in another computer, uh, there we use Node.js and Express.js. Those are frameworks. Um, it's, I don't want to go into the discussion whether these are the best or the, the most hyped ones. We simply use them because they are also using JavaScript. So we don't have to introduce yet another programming language. We can use the same. Um, we don't do any persistence in this course. It's an important topic, but it's simply not a part of this course. So this is something you'd cover in other courses on databases. Um, and then finally, we use, of course, some corresponding tools, for example, for testing. Uh, in our case, we use the JavaScript testing tools, Mocha and Chai. That's just a uh, decision I made. There is no proper argument of why this might be better or not than other tools. Then uh, in all my examples, I use VS Code as an IDE uh, simply because it exists for different platforms and because it's easy and quick. Again, I don't need to argue whether or not this is the best solution. It's one that works. Um, everything I, I display and test is usually done in Firefox and Chrome. So again, these are probably the two largest ones. There could be other choices. Uh, we use those. Then at some point when we go to the back end, uh, we will use a tool called Postman and that's used to send requests without a browser. So it's essentially a testing or debugging tool to send requests around, uh, which can be quite complicated if you want to do that through, for example, Firefox. So uh, at this point in time, you don't really need to understand what this does. You'll see that later in the course. Uh, and then as already discussed, we use Node.js and uh, NPM, which is the environment that comes with Node. It's basically used to install dependencies. So if you want to use a certain library of functionality, you use NPM. We will see that a lot later. Good, uh, that's it for the introduction. So now you should have an idea what this course is about and whether it's something for you or not. Uh, I'd be happy to get questions from you if there are any. Uh, either directly in the videos or through my personal website. You can find my email address as well. So uh, don't shy away from uh, writing. And the next lecture when we actually start is going into the basics of networking and going into the HTTP protocol so that we have some kind of understanding of, of how the World Wide Web actually works and how the communication works. So that's it for now. Thank you very much for watching.